Asmat Guru Biyanamaha, Asmat Parama Guru Biyanamaha, Asmat Sarva Guru Biyanamaha. We're continuing on with our discussion. We're discussing Mamukshapati um, by Pila Lokacharya with a commentary by Manavala Mahamunigo. And we're in the Dwaya Prakarnam. And that means the, uh, the middle section of the book dealing with the Dwaya Mantram. The Dwaya Mantram, Sriman Narayana Charano Sharanam Papadye, Srimate Narayana Maha. It's called Dwaya Mantra because it easily separates into two halves. So we have, up until now, we've discussed uh, a ge the general meaning of the whole mantra. And uh, now we began to take word by word and starting with the first, starting with the, uh, the first section. So we, so we actually have the word Sriman or Srimat, right, in both sections. So Sriman Narayana Charano, Sharanam Papadye is the first section. And then Srimate Narayanaya Namaha. So two forms of the word Sriman or Srimat. Uh, in the uh, uh, start, which start, that word starts both sections. So it's a very important word. And for Sri Vaishnavas, we know that the word Sri is important to us because uh, uh, Mahalakshmi is the first Acharya, or you know, after the Lord, is the first Acharya in our Parampara, in our lineage. And also, she's very important as the mediatrix, as the as the uh, as the mediator, or the, what we call in Sanskrit the Purushakara, between the souls who are like her children, and the Lord who is like her, who is her husband, who is her consort. So, just the, so this uh, analogy of the family is uh, is a very good analogy to understand the relationship between the soul and God. And the relationship between the soul and Mahalakshmi. So Mahalakshmi is like our mother. And in fact, Ramanuja in his uh, Sharanagati Gajam calls her Jagan Matara, the mother of the universe, and he or the mother of the world, we can say, right? And uh, he also he says uh, immediately after saying that in Sharanagati Gajam, he says Asmad Matara, my mother. So you're the mother of the universe, he says. And he says, you're my mother, immediately after that. And this is in the very first part of the Sharnagati Gajam, which is one of the three prose works of Ramanuja. And the, it's the first one and most important, let's say, one, because it deals with surrender, Sharnagati. And very first part of Sharnagati uh, in the Sharnagati Gajam is the prayer to Sri, the prayer to Mahalakshmi, the prayer to Goddess Mukti, Sri Devi. So just as... The prayer to Sri Devi is the first thing in the Sharanakati Gajam. So, so the, the, the mention of Sri is the first thing that we find in the Gwaya Mantra. And the first thing that we find in both parts of the Gwaya Mantra. So anyway, we're talking about Sri. And we discussed how Sri could, what, uh, the meaning of the word Sri. Like, and there could be Sriyate and Shriyate. There could be two different um, verbal, there could be an active and a passive way of explaining this verb. Uh, okay, so we did that last time, and now we're coming to the point where, we, where he wants to explain the ending, because we're talking about the word, and the word is Srimat. So what does Mat mean, or what does Man mean? Yeah, so now we're going to discuss from uh, Sutra uh, 1 or Churna 130, we're going to discuss the meaning of the word Mat, or the, the ending Mat that goes on Sri, so Srimat. Sri Mate Narayana Namaha, the last part, or Sri Man Narayana Charanam Sharanam Prabhupada. So what does Man or Mat mean? All right, so let's have a look at, uh, let's have a look at the text. So here on the text, here on the text, um, what it says uh, in the beginning here, if this is just the end of uh, Manavala Bhamuni's um, commentary on the 129th Sutra, and we notice that when Manavala Mahamuni or when the commentator, commentator uh, explains the sutras, what he does is he brings us to the point of the next sutra by asking a question. So the question will be answered by the next, uh, by the next sutra. So the question is, the question that we come up now that we've understood the, the different meanings of the word Sri. And by the way, we were discussing last time that uh, uh, according to the Northern School or the Wadagalai uh, Deshika Sampradaya, the followers of Vedanta Deshika, 
Shri means the same thing in the in the beginning when it comes in the beginning of the first part of Dwaya Mantra as it does in the second part, beginning of the second part of Dwaya Mantra. Whereas the Tengalai conception is it means something slightly different. We discussed that last time. So now, uh, after understanding the different meanings of the word Shri, right? He says thus. He has therefore presented the meaning of the stem, the, the verbal root, Shri, uh, of the word Shrimat. Uh, after, uh, after this, he presents the meaning of the suffix. In other words, the meaning of Mat or Man. Okay. So now, Sutra 130, the suffix Mat, right, states that their union is eternal. Whose union? The Supreme Lord, Sriman Narayana, and his? Divine consort, my main divine consort, so primary, peria peria, uh, peria pirati, the, the, the main goddess, right? That is Mahalakshmi, Sri Devi. So, since this suffix mut, right, uh, is the mut, since, since this suffix mut is the mut that means eternal union. This says that the union of these two, the goddess, who is the mediator, and the Lord, exists forever. He demonstrates that their union is eternal. So let's see what, let's see uh, what, you know, this is pretty obvious stuff. Let's see what uh, uh, Phoebe and Angacharya says about this particular comment here. So again, the though uh, through through the through the mud or mut ending that comes after Sri, so Sri Mat or Sriman, right? It is shown that the togetherness of the, the the togetherness or the closeness of the divine couple is eternal. Um, the term Srimat or Srimat, right? The first part Sri has been explained thus far. Now the mud, which is joined with Sri, is explained. The mud is taken to show the eternal togetherness of the divine couple. Okay, so let's go back to the main text. Okay, so sutra number 131. Only in conjunction with her does the subject, the Lord, exist. It's a sort of a strange translation, but anyway. The Lord's, the Lord's property of being the husband of Sri is stated before the attributes of knowledge, bliss, etc. Right? So if he's if you're going to if you're going to describe the Lord, here the, the description of the Lord starts off with the fact that he is the husband of the goddess of fortune, because that's most important in the pro, in the process of property or sharanagati. So the Lord's property of being the husband of Sri is stated before the attributes of knowledge, bliss, etc. He has Ananta Kalyana Gunas. He has unlimited attributes, auspicious attributes, uh, okay, which describe his essential nature or Swarupa, Swarupa Nirupaka, uh, in the following in the following passage, right? And this passage is from. Ramanuja's introduction to the Gita Basya. So Ramanuja wrote nine books, three, book, three commentaries on the Vedanta Sutra called Sri Basya, Vedanta uh, Deepa, and Vedanta Sara. Then he wrote a commentary on, on uh, a summary of commentary on the, on the Upanishads called Vedanta Sangraha. He wrote one, he wrote a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. All Acharyas write, write commentaries on these three primary texts. So that is called Gita Basya. So here, this is from the Gita Basya. So then after we have those five, those five books, we have another four books, which are the three Gajas, right? Sharanagati Gajya, Sri Ranga Gajya, Vaikuntha Gajya. And then we have one book of daily practice, which includes about two of Radhanam, how to do the puja, how to do worship. That is called the Nitya, Nitya Granta. Okay, so those are the nine works attributed to Ramanuja. So, uh, there, sometimes there's some other works which are attributed to him. There's a work on astrology, which some people say he wrote. There's a work, there's another Vedantic work, which some people say he wrote. But these, these nine works are accepted in, in the Sampradaya by most people as being the only the works of Ramanuja. Okay, so here we have this. This statement comes from the Gita Basya, the introduction to the Gita Basya, the commentary on Bhagavad Gita by Ramanuja. Husband of Sri, 
opposed to all that is evil, the locus of all, the place or the, the, the location of all, right? Locus is just the Latin word for location or, or place. The, the place of all that is auspicious, whose sole nature is eternal knowledge and bliss, distinct from all other than himself, uh, all things other than himself. Okay, so right here in uh, Ramanuja, when he introduces the, because some people believe it or not, some people, even Shankaracharya doesn't do this, but some people who, when they comment on the Gita, they comment in such a way as to not accept the fact that Sri Narayana or Lord Krishna is God. They, they, they somehow or other, they, they give a, 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 ju a, a jumbled interpretation of Bhagavad Gita where they don't accept. Uh, it's very easy to do this in the Upanishads to, 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 find, to think that something else is God or there is no God. There's just, the, there's no personal God. There's only Brahman, there's an impersonal energy. Uh, but in Bhagavad Gita, it's very, very difficult to, to write God, to write a person God out of the, out of the equation. Well, we look, for instance, in Bhagavad Gita, where it says, Brahmano hi pratistanam. Krishna himself says, I am the, I am the source of Brahman. I am the source of, of the eternal spirit, the, the impersonal spirit. Um, so, so somehow or other, there are people who, who get in there and they interpret that the other way around, and they, or they completely gloss over the, the statements of Arjuna when Arjuna says, Krishna, he says, Krishna, you're God. He realizes Krishna is God. He says, Param Brahma, Param Dhamma, Pavitram, Param Ambavam, Purusham, Shashvatam, Divyam, Adi Devam, Adi Devam, you're the original God. Adi Devam, Aham, he says, Ahustram, Rishaya Sarve, Deva Rishi, Naradas Tada, Asito, Devalo, Vyasa. So Vyasa, Asita, Devala, Narada, all of these Rishis, they say that also, that you're the original God. So somehow or other, there are some people who read Bhagavad Gita and they, and they don't realize that Krishna is God or Sriman Narayana is, is God. Um, even after reading about the, the, even after reading all these statements and, and seeing that Krishna manifests the universal form, still somehow they have, they, they have it wrong. But here in the very beginning, and even Shankaracharya admits in his Gita, in his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, he says, Narayana Parovyaktat, Narayana is above, Sriman Narayana is above all. He is above all. That's what Shankaracharya says. So now, so it's it, even for Shankaracharya, it was just a, a bridge too far for him to say that to write Krishna or, or Narayana completely out of the Bhagavad Gita as being God. But here, Ramanuja from the very beginning, this is the beginning, the introduction of his Gita Basya. He says straight up front, who is God? Who is God? Who is the Supreme? The Supreme is the husband of Sri. The very first thing he says is the husband of Sri, because that is the most important. That's the most important aspect of we for us. That's the most important aspect of, of the Lord, that he's the husband of Sri. Why? Because we've just got through talking about the idea that if we go to Sri, if we approach, if we approach the goddess Mahalakshmi, his divine consort, our mother, the mother of the universe, if we approach her as the mediator in our, in our surrender to the Lord, our, our surrender must be successful. Absolutely must be successful if we do that. This is why the Dwaya Mantra is considered so great because the Dwaya Mantra specifically, although we, we saw even in Omkara, even in the Astakshara Mantra, Om Namo Narayanaya, we saw that the goddess is mentioned there, but, but not specifically mentioned in an, es in an esoteric way, in, a, in an esoteric way, in a, we've, we've seen that she's, she, her, the idea of her is there in the, in the meanings of, the, of those mantras, but not specifically. If you go to somebody and you say, oh, chant Om or chant Om the Monarai and I, okay, they don't immediately say, oh, I can understand that the meaning of these, of Omkara and Om the Monarai and I means that Lakshmi is involved. They don't immediately understand that. Until, until they read, you know, the commentary on the mantra by Vedanta Deshika and, and other acharyas like the uh, Pila Lokacharya. But with the Dwaya mantra, there's absolutely no 
um, no argument about it because it's right there in the beginning of each part of the Dwaya Mantra. Sriman Narayana Tarana, Srimati Narayana Maha. That's why this mantra is considered so great by Sri Vaishnavas because it specifically and explicitly uh, explains Sri, enunciates about Sri. Okay, so anyway, uh, so Ramanuja here in the, in the Gita Basya, he, he mentions immediately uh, that the Lord, that Lord Sri Narayana is God. And the very first and most important aspect of, of, of the Lord, of what's the most important attribute that he has? The most important attribute that he has is he's the husband of Sri. Because without Sri, we don't know if our Sharanagati, if our property will be successful. But with her, approaching her means it must be successful. Therefore, since this is the primary designation of his essential nature, right? If we're going to say one thing and one thing only, what is the primary, uh, the primary, um, a primary description of the Lord's nature? It is that he's the husband of Sri. He's the husband of Mahalakshmi. That's why Sri Vaishnavas always say Sriman Narayana. They never just say Narayana. They always say Sriman Narayana because they always want to mention that, that description of him as being the husband of Sri. So it is only in conjunction with her that the subject, the Lord, truly exists. So this, is, this is, sounds a little bit like hyperbole, a little bit of an exaggeration, to say that God, what is the, what is the point of God if not for Sri Devi, if not for Mahalakshmi, if not for his divine consort, if not... If there were no, in, in, there were no Purushakar, if there were no mediator, if there was no nobody to mediate between him and the and the and the living beings, right? We find that there are some there are some religions in this world like uh, Judaism. Um, there there may be some others like that. They they are con they considered to be deistic religions. A deistic religion is where God and the living beings and the world are somewhat separated. God created everything, yes, and he got the ball rolling, and now everything is sort of going on by the forces of nature and everything like that, and God is very much taking a back seat and he's just observing, and he's not imminent. He's not imminently connected with the, with the, with the creation or the, or the living beings. Whereas Sri Vaishnavism is not like that at all. It's not a deistic religion. You know, it talks very much about the imminence of the Supreme Lord and also uh, uh, Mother Mahalakshmi with the, and their involvement with the, with the uh, material nature and the, and the, and the living beings, especially the involvement in uh, trying to help the living beings to attain moksha, attain liberation, eternal service to Sri Narayana in Vaikuntha. Thus, he has revealed that their eternal union results from their relationship being a property of the Lord's essential nature. Right, so basically what he's saying here is he's saying, why are they eternally related? Why are they eternally together? They're eternally together because Mahalakshmi is the primary attribute of the Lord. She's the primary attribute of the Lord. She's the most important attribute of the Lord. Therefore, she, she's always associated with him. So uh, in Sanskrit, they call that Swarupa Anubanda. Anubanda means connection, right? Itva means ness, right? Prayukta. Prayukta. After this, he reveals that their eternal union is also a result of her qualities. Okay? So he's looking at it from his point of view, from the Supreme Lord's point of view. His union with Mahalakshmi is is eternal because she's the most essential and most primary of his qualities. Now let's look at it from her point of view, from her qualities. Right, so let's see what P.B. Anandacharya has to say about um, Sutra 131. So Sutra 131, again, the meaning is, it is only with her that Ishwara Tattva exists, right? So again, it's maybe a little bit strange to, you know, this is, uh, you know, maybe seen as a little bit of hyperbole here that of course God always exists, whether 
whether Sri Devi and whether the rest of us exist, God always exists. He, you know, we look in the Upanishads and we can see statements like, in the beginning there was one and the one became many. So obviously the one was there before the many. All right, but so, <clears throat> you know, uh, let's look at this. So P.B. Nangachay says, what is the nature of the together togetherness of the divine couple? We've just mentioned that they're always together. So now he wants to explain in different ways how and why they are always together. So just as knowledge and joy is natural to him, Sri Manarayana, so too is being the consort of Sri. It's part of his nature. And in fact, it's the most important part of his nature. Therefore, it is together with her, that Ishwara Tattva, that, that, the, that the, the category of God exists, right? He has to exist because she exists. It, it, it's a little, it's a little, a bit of uh, Shastra hyper, hyperbole here. But anyway, it's, uh, we get the point. So going back to the main text, okay, text 132. Seeing the Lord's autonomy, right? The Lord is autonomous. Um, <clears throat> seeing the Lord's autonomy, the Lord's auto autonomous. See, this is the point, right? The point is that we know that another one of the great qualities of Sriman Narayana is he is he is Swatantra. He is completely independent, right? And uh, we can say he's self-satisfied. He's independent. He's, you know, he doesn't rely on any, any, anything or anybody else, right? Therefore, that independence that would be, if he were, if he were, if he were, if he were dependent in any way, then uh, then then that would be against that idea of being swar uh, uh, swatantra, completely independent, right? Everybody else is paratantra. Everybody else is dependent upon him, including the goddess Sri is dependent on him. So if he if if we are if we are not to um, compromise his eternal independence, therefore we have to have this mediator, Sri Devi, right? Because if if he's completely independent, it means he might not save us. He might not agree to accept us, even if we surrender to him, because he is completely independent. If somebody's, if you know, if you go into a negotiation and there are two sides. And one side says, oh, I am offering you this. And the other, the other side says, you know, I can take it or leave it. I don't need to take it. I don't need to take this offer. I don't need to. Uh, I, can, I can take it or leave it like that. It's the mediator. With, it's then when the mediator is involved. The mediator is important to, to make sure that that side accepts our surrender, that the Lord accepts our surrender. Right. So seeing the Lord's autonomy. And the chaitana means the soul, the individual jivatman sins, right? She doesn't want to leave. This is her compassion. Her compassion is so great that she sees that he's independent. She sees that he could walk away from the, the, the table, from the, from the negotiation. He could, he could decide to just reject the, the, the soul surrender. Because he's, he has this nature of a swatantra. He's completely independent. She knows that. And she also sees that, this, that he set up this system of karma where people do, do punyas and papas. They do good acts and bad acts and they get reactions for them. And those reactions attach to those living beings in this material world and, and make them go through different bodies, species after species, in this, in this, in round and round in samsara, the cycle of birth, death, and old age and disease. And so she sees that, and she sees that each of these, the living entities have lived there from time immemorial and they have mountains of sins, right? They've committed, every, according to Yamunacharya in uh, Stotaratna, we've committed every sin. We've, we've, we've lived so many lives in so many species that we've committed every sin that you can even think of and the ones that you can't even think of. So we have all those sins, those burden of sins on us. What to speak of the good things that we've done are also burdens because those good things, those good acts also keep us here in this material world because we have to stay here in order to enjoy the good karma too. So the Chaitanya sins are innumerable. They're immeasurable. So she knows that. And she also knows his, 
divine independence. So that's why she doesn't for a minute, for a second, leave him. She's always with him because she always has to be there with him, right? Because it's her duty to be a mediator. She always has to be there because if she wasn't there to mediate, there would be a possibility because of his autonomy and because of our sins that our sharanagati, our, our, our surrender might not work. Therefore, out of her infinite divine compassion, she is always there with him. So some people say, you know, we say, often we say, oh, Lakshmi is always with Narayana. Sri Devi is always with Narayana everywhere. She's always with, with him. She's always, she's always, she's always, always accompanies him like that. We're, often we see deities of, of Lakshmi and Narayana together like that, um, right? In temples uh, together, you know, when we see the Lord go on procession, with, he'll go with Sri Devi. You know, well, it, it's very common. But what, what, why do we, we think why? Why is she there with him? This is the reason, for our benefit only. Not for her benefit, not for any other reason, because she knows he's completely independent and because she knows the heap of sins that we, the immeasurable amount of sins that we have, right? She, she wants to make the deal. She wants to get the, the, the negotiation completed. The negotiation is how the, the souls can be, can have their surrender accepted by the Lord. So therefore, out of her divine compassion, she is always accompanying the Lord so she can always play that part of, his, of, of a mediator as Purushakara and, should, and, make our, and make our surrender successful, 100%. So she sees the autonomy of the Lord, which adds, uh, which, who adds up uh, uh, each soul's sins by the score and meets out punishment. She sees the Chaitanya's, the soul's sins of omission and commission, right? We, there are different sins, right? There are some sins, there are different rules. In Sanskrit, we have two, two words for rules, yama and niyama. So yama is do's and niyama is don'ts. So there are things that we, that we should do and there are things that we shouldn't do. So if we don't do what we should do, right? That's a sin of omission. We have omitted to do something. And therefore, that's a sin of omission that because we are told, for the example of Sanjurandana, a person after, doing, after having initiation into the Gayatri Mantra and, and being initiated into doing the Sanjurandana, he has to do it every day. If he doesn't do it, it's a sin, right? He doesn't get any real benefit uh, spiritually. I mean, he does, of course, get some benefit because he's meditating on Gayatri Mantra and all these things. But, but, but it's, not, it's, not a, it's not something that somebody does for a separate benefit. He does it because it's, it's ordered in the scriptures and he has to do it. If he doesn't do it, it's a sin. That is a sin of omission. He has omitted to do it. He, that's a sin of omission. There's another sin, which is a sin of commission. If I murder someone, right? Or if I do something bad, I get, which is a sin, right? There are many different types of sins. There are these five Mahapapas, five great sins. And then there are many, many minor sins. So um, if I do something uh, that is sinful like that, then that is a sin of commission. So if I commit a murder, that's why they say you committed murder, you committed a, a robbery, or you committed adultery, or you committed whatever it is, whatever the sin is. Yeah. So that's a sin of commission. So there are sins of omission and sins of commission. So she sees all that. Malachmi sees all those sins of omission and commission that we have done which are so many that they cannot be destroyed even after a million lives of Brahma. Think about it, add it up. If any of us have ever, you know, done the numbers, right? The life of Brahma is what? His, he, you know, his, his, his blinking of an eyelid or day, day and night, the blinking of an eyelid basically is like a, the, the normal devas, the regular devas, their day is like one year for us. The Lord Brahma is even, it's even longer, right? So, so his uh, a blink of an eye basically is like a year for us. So imagine, imagine how many times you blink your eye in a day, in a year, in, in your whole lifetime. Can it, that's how many years we have, right? That's how many years there are in, in, in Brahma's life. And he's talking about here, you cannot, that those sins of omission and commission, the result of those cannot be destroyed even after 
millions of lives of Brahma. That's a very, very long time. So of course it's, you know, again, hyperbole, it's again, exaggeration. We're trying to, you know, we're, we're trying to explain, not, not, that we, not that we want to work this out mathematically. The point being made is that we have infinite sins, basically. We have immeasurable sin, an immeasurable, immeasurable burden of sin on us. So that is, even if the Chaitanya, even if the soul endured the entire expanse of time, it would, it would be impossible to reach the end of them. Right. So sometimes people think, okay, we're here in this material world. As long as we are doing sins and we're doing good de deeds, we're being kept here and we're going round and round in some so. So isn't it possible? Isn't it possible that we live a good life? Why don't we live a good life this lifetime and maybe the next lifetime or the next couple of thousand million lifetimes or whatever it is, is it, wouldn't it be possible eventually if we live a very good life and we, we don't do any sins of commission or we don't do any sins of omission, you know, and we, and then, and then we, all of our good karmas also are, you know, if we just live a life like that eventually after many, many births and deaths, right? Won't we eventually get to the point where our karma is nil and then we'll just go to Vaikuntha? We'll be automatically liberated because there's nothing holding us here in this material world. That's a theory, right? Some people might have that theory. But here what it's saying is basically that's impossible. You're, you're, that's wishful thinking. You're thinking that somehow or other you can run the, run the clock out on your karmas. That, oh, yeah, it'll, you know. Eventually, you know, okay, I'll have to suffer for this for a few lifetimes or whatever it is, but eventually I'll, you know, I'll have zero karma and I'll, I'll be liberated. No, that's not going to happen. Unless you take to the process, processes actually given by the Lord, karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, or property, you're going to be here in this material world for sure, right? Uh, Pila Lokacharya in his Arta Panchigam adds one more, one more possibility, Acharya Abhimana which means surrender to the Acharya. So these are the, these are the different processes. Even then, Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga, normally they just lead to Bhakti Yoga. Uh, and not, we, there's very, I think there's some very rare occasions where they talk about Karma Yoga or Jnana Yoga as leading to, um, to actual liberation. And even, so like I think the, king, the example of Karma Yoga leading to liberation is King Janaka. And another, another example would be the jnana yoga leading to liberation a lot of times may only lead to impersonal liberation, what we call kaivalya mukti or divine isolation. And uh, Brahma Anubhava, the, um, the enjoyment of the self only, that's not you know, the, the highest uh, form of liberation that we, that we usually talk about, which is a personal service to the Supreme Lord in Vaikuntha. Okay, so... So in any case, uh, the sins of the souls are immense. They're innumerable, they're immeasurable, and they can't be overcome. So don't even think about uh, trying to overcome them by the process of simply staying in this material world and going and, and running out your karma. That's not going to happen, right? So the only real way, and, and in, uh, according to the Tengalais, according to the Southern School of Sri Vaishnavism, the only real way is surrender. Even bhakti yoga itself, and I think we've discussed this before, involves uh, a small amount. Any any path of effort involves a small amount of ego, and we know from the Dwaya, from the Tirumantra Prakaram, the previous section of, of Mamuchapati, that the word namo or namaha is there to remind us and to help us to overcome that highness and minus which keeps us here in this material world. Right. So if there's just a hint of minus and minus in, uh, in bhakti yoga, that also has to be given up. So property is really the, sh the sure way, the surest way, the safest way, the safest, the safest way. And that property includes Goddess Mahalakshmi as the first and foremost principle. So, um, so that is, even if the Chaitanya, even if the soul endured the, the entire expanse of time, it would be impossible to reach the end of those sins. Thus, fearful what, might, what may happen, 
right? She does not leave the Lord even for a moment. He explains how this benefits the Jaitana. Well, I think we can understand how this benefits the individuals, the fact that she's always with the Lord. But uh, let's first of all see what uh, PB and Anitra is about. Uh, text 132. So again, the meaning of text of Sutra 132 is seeing that he, the Supreme Lord, is completely independent and that the chaitanas or sins are great uh, uh, souls, are great sinners, she will not separate from him even for the smallest moment. The eternal togetherness of the divine couple also happens due to one of her qualities. That is her infinite compassion, right? Noting his great independence and that he can punish those who have sinned, as well as noting the countless sins committed by the chaitanas, or the souls, she is greatly concerned about what might happen if she is not around and therefore, if she's not present, right, and therefore would not leave him even for a moment. So this is the, this is the mark of a mother, right? The mother is always concerned about the welfare of the children and, and therefore she will not leave the family unit even for a moment. Because, and, and the same thing with a good mediator, a good mediator in a discussion where there's a deal that, that, that may go, they will never leave the two sides together without the mediator. The mediator will never leave that discussion until the, the, the deal is done. Because they know if they leave the two sides together, the two sides will have problems with each other and the, and the deal will fall apart. This happens a lot, you know, that there's some, there's some mediation between two groups who have difficulties with each other. And uh, if the arbitrator or the mediator isn't there, right? If, as long as the mediator is there, the mediator is able to soften the positions of each party and to get the deal done. As soon as the mediator walks away, those, the, 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 the two parties become irre irreconcilable again. So that is the problem because of our sins and because of the Lord's independence, uh, eternal independence, we appear to be irreconcil irreconcilable with him. But so only, only through the grace of Mahalakshmi can we reconcile with the Supreme Lord. So let's go back to the original text, text 133. So text 133, again, now, now that we've explained, now that we've explained, uh, from his side and also from her side, what the qualities are, right? What their main qualities are, right? What is the benefit? What is the benefit to the children? What is the benefit to the souls, the chaitanas in this world, the, the Bada Jivas, those who are covered? The chaitana doesn't need to be afraid thinking of these two. Doesn't need to be afraid thinking of these two. This gives us confidence. Since she stays and watches over him, right? So the mother is there. The children, when the mother is present, right? The children are never afraid, right? So since, uh, since she stays and watches over him, the Chaitana, the Chaitana, when he thinks of these two things, the Lord's autonomy and his own sins, Need not, need not fear, he need not fear what might happen, right? So for instance, sometimes we, sometimes we get like this, we get morose or we get fearful because especially in the morning, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the system of uh, Sri Vaishnava Anikam, when we wake up, we're supposed to, before even getting out of bed, we're supposed to regret that we've wasted our, the, we've wasted our life up until this point. And today we're going to do something positive and we're going to serve the Lord and we're going to again engage in our proper constitutional, eternal um, position as his servant. Um, so sometimes we regret, sometimes we, that we have some slight regret. If we have some slight regret that we've wasted our lives or we've wasted uh, millions of lives actually, right, without surrendering to the Lord. So this can be there. This, this uh, mentality can be there, especially it's supposed to, you're supposed to think like this but only momentarily in the morning. You know, it's not 
it's not that you should be morose and go around all day thinking, oh, you know, whoa, am I, I didn't do it. I haven't, you know, done anything. And, you know, you shouldn't think, continually feel like that. You should feel uh, uh, lucky and happy that the Lord is going to save you. And you should expect him to save you. Right? You should have faith in that he will save you. That is called Mahavishvasha. That is also a part of, of property, part of, of Sharanagati or surrender. Is you should feel that he will, he will definitely save you, especially after reading this about Mahalakshmi, who could not believe that. Right? So your, 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 your negotiation is 100% guaranteed because you have the best mediator. Right? So... So we think about this, we, we may think about this, the Lord's autonomy and our sins, and we may, may become fearful. But she says, or he, the Pilokacharya is saying here, that the Chaitanya doesn't need to be afraid because he can think of these, these points, these points that we just discussed. When we think about that, immediately a great burden of fear is lifted from us, right? right? Previously, we think, well, there might be something that I've done or not done which is a straw breaker, which is the straw that breaks the camel's back and is, is, going, is a deal breaker, or we, what we say, a deal breaker. There might be this one little thing which can break that deal of Sharanagati, right? And, and he says, no, there isn't. As long as Sri Devi is there, you have no worries. Okay, so after this, he presents the essential meaning of the suffix, okay? So first of all, as with every explanation here, the very first way that Tapila Lokacharya does it in Manavalamamani is they first of all give a general explanation and uh, and 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 look at the look at the explanation from different points of view. And then what they do is they get more specific about the, the, the suffix, right? With what, remember what we're talking about is the suffix on Sri, Sri Mat or Sri Man. Okay, so let's see uh Bibi and Angacharya's um, Commentary on verse 133, Sutra 133. So again, the sutra here, right, is the Chaitana or the soul who comes to him as a sinner, right, who tries to approach God, but is a sinner, right, right, because there are other souls who are not sinners. There's the Nitya Suris in Vaikuntha, right, but the ones who need to approach him in order to get liberation are the ones who are the sinners in this material world does not need to fear thinking about his, ind his independence, the Lord's independence, and his, meaning the soul's, sins. So, because she is with him eternally, because Mahalakshmi is eternally with the Lord, because Sri Devi is eternally there, because she is the Purushikara, she is the mediatrix, she is the arbitrator and the mediator in our discussion with the Lord. Because of that, and watching out for this, she's watching out for, for this, this point, these points, right? His independence and our sins. She's watching these two points, which are the points of contention, yeah, in the, in the negotiation. The Chaitanya or the soul does not have to fear thinking about his independence and his sins. We don't have to fear about those. Those are the things which keep us apart from God, his independence and our sins. Those are the sticking points in this negotiation. We don't have to bother about thinking about this, those sticking points because we have that perfect mediator, Mahalakshmi. Let her worry about that. She's the mediator, so let her worry about it. It is the job of the mediator to worry about the differences that the two sides have. Right? He doesn't have to worry about it. The Supreme Lord doesn't have to worry. We don't, and we now also, we don't have to worry about it. He's completely independent. Whether we attain liberation or not, he's still independent and he's completely self-satisfied. And of course, he feels he also feels compassion for the souls, but still, right, he is independent. She, however, has extreme dependence on him, just as we have dependence on him and her, right? And therefore, she has this, this compassion that she can mediate perfectly between the two. Because she always has these, she always has our best, uh, our best, uh, you know, uh, she has always have best thoughts for us, you know. She, ha she always has our best, the best intentions for us, you know. Okay, so let's look at uh, Sutra 134. 
Sutra 134 here. Now we're talking about, so now we're going to talk about the essential meaning of the suffix. What is the suffix again? Mat or man on Sriman. Sriman or Srimate. Right. So Sutra 34, this means that for resorting to the Lord, for surrendering to him, for doing property, right? Only the desire is necessary. Only the desire is necessary, right? It's a mental thing. We must desire. There is no need to be mindful of the time. There's no need to be mindful of the time. This suffix, mat or man, indicating in this, in this way the eternal union of the mediator and the upaya, the mediator being Mahalakshmi and the upaya, which means the means, which means the Lord, right? The, uh, means that for one who takes refuge with the Lord, only the desire to do so is necessary. We simply have to desire to take refuge of the Lord. That is taking refuge of the Lord, right? So some people say, oh, in order to surrender, you have to do this and 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 this. No, you do not, right? You have to completely give up thinking like that, give up doing this do that, all these things you have to do. No, 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 no. You simply have to desire to surrender to the Lord. If you desire to surrender to the Lord, if you desire surrender, that's enough. It is, it is not necessary to wait for an appropriate time, right? I'll surrender, you know, like, you know, I'm working my job now. After I retire, when I, when I turn 65 and I'm getting social security, you know, from the government and I, you know, or, you know, right now I'm raising my children and, you know, I'm in family life or, you know, actually I'm studying, I'm going to college right now. After I get my degree, I can think about surrendering to the Lord or, you know, if only I made enough money to or to to do this or to do that then after that i'll think about surrendering to the lord no it can be done right here and right now it can be done at any time right there's no prerequisite there's no prerequisite for property right all it, all it all it uh, requires is the desire it is not necessary to wait for an appropriate time to take refuge thinking that one can only do so when they're united. And some people think, oh, for instance, we have this COVID situation, nobody can travel. So somebody said, well, you know, I will do Sharanagati. Um, after COVID's finished, what I'll do is I'll get on a plane, I'll go to India and there'll be a guru there and I'll go and approach the guru and then I'll do Sharanagati. It's not necessary. Sharanagati can be done here and now, right this instant by simply desiring to do it to desire to take refuge is to take refuge so after this in order to uh so what does it say the last thing here. it is not necessary to wait for an appropriate time to take refuge thinking that one can only do so when they united right so even if we have this idea oh you know uh therefore it's so important that mahalakshmi is is there and that we do it in a certain way, you know, like in, in Sri Rangam, uh, they have this situation where they have the liturgical calendar of the, of the temple and on Panguni Uttaram, you know, in, in March, April, right? You have this, this time when Lord Ranganatha goes to the, the Mahalakshmi's uh, Ranganayaki, his consort's um, uh, temple, and he goes inside there and he sits all the night with her. And then, then everybody goes in and chants the Sharanagati Gajam and, and does formal surrender to the Lord. So somebody might think, oh, I have to wait until Lord Ranganath goes there on that date. And if I miss it, right? If I miss it, then I'll just wait till next year. Like that. No, you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait because although Lord Ranganath only goes there in his deity form and is there with Mahalakshmi one night of the year, he is always with her. He's always united with her. She's always with him. So you can always approach him. You can always approach him. You don't have to wait until you can. If the temple's closed, it doesn't matter. You, you don't have to wait to surrender to him. Even the temple's closed, even if it's not a festival day of Pangolini Uttara, you, you don't have to wait. So after this, in order to make known that her mediation is absolutely necessary, 
he explains the difference between her presence and her absence. Her presence and her absence. Now, this may be a little bit difficult to understand because we just got through saying that she's never absent. So how can we now talk about her absence? So there's an apparent absence in some leelas when the Lord comes to this world. There's an, just like in the example is going to be given about, uh, about in the Ramayana. In the Ramayana, we have Sita and Rama together, Lord Srimanarayana and Goddess Mahalakshmi, uh, in the form of Ram, uh, Lord Ramachandra and, and Sita Devi are together for some time. But then part, a lot of the Ramayana, they're apart. She's absent. Right? She's not with the Lord. So, so there's an apparent absence. There's an apparent absence. So we'll talk about that in a second. So let's see what P.B. Nangacharya has to say about uh, 134. Okay, so text 134 again. Uh, through the use of mud or man or mud, right, uh, this, this ending, uh, it's expressed that in order to surrender to him, all that is required is an interest in seeking him. Right? It's interesting here the way he puts it, an interest in seeking him, not even a burning desire, but just an interest in surrender, right? in seeking him. There is no need to consider time as a factor. In addition, because she's eternally with him, Mahalakshmi is eternally with Sri Manarayana, the Chaitanya or the living being in this world can seek him at any time. He does not have to wait and check to see if she is with him before approaching him. He just has to develop the taste to seek him. As soon as the interest is born, he can approach him. Right, so back to the main text. So text 135, right? So uh, again, we're gonna talk about now uh, after this, in order to, to make in order to make known that her mediation is absolutely necessary, we're going to look at two situations. We're going to look at a situation where she was there and there was mediation, and when she was absent and there was no mediation. And that'll show us how essential it is the mediation is, right? If we want to judge how essential something is, take it away and see if it works without her. See if see if you know, if you want to see if a, if you want to see if the deal will go through without a mediator, try and try and uh, make up with the other party yourself. Try and make the deal without the mediator. If you try and make the deal without the mediator and you can't do it, obviously you needed the mediator, right? So, text one thirty five. In her presence, the crow. In her presence, the crow was saved. In her absence, Ravana perished. Okay. So here's two stories from the Ramayana here. Remember, Ramayana is a very great Shastra. We discussed in uh, um, the Sri Vachana Bhushana, which is the, the next book to be studied after Mumkshapati usually, um, that uh, Ramayana is considered to be the topmost Shastra below the Vedas, right? Uh, the Itihasas, the Ramayana Ma Mahabharata are, are above the Puranas in, in uh, in the level of pramanas or proofs, Shastra proofs, and, and Ramayana is greater than Mahabharata. So the Ramayana is, a, is called Sharanagati Shastra. It is full of surrender. If we read the Ramayana, it will be full of different aspects of surrender. So here we have two certain situations. There was a, there was a Kakasura. Kaka means a, Kaka means a crow in Sanskrit. So Kakasura means a demon crow. There was this demon crow that that pecked at, 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 uh, at Lakshmi. And that crow was saved. Lord Rama wanted to kill the crow for pecking Lakshmi, or Sita, excuse me, Sita David, right? Um, but because she was there and she was compassionate, the crow was not killed, it was saved, right? In her absence, right, Ravana perished. Where was Sita? She was in the Ashokavana. She was in the forest of the Ashok trees. She was being kept prisoner by these Rakshashis. Ravana went to fight with Lord Rama and he was killed. So whereas the crow, the crow committed a sin by pecking her uh, and the crow was saved because she was present. Ravana committed the sin by attacking Rama, but because she wasn't present, he was killed. That's the point. So the goddess 
whose form is compassion. And this, uh, this, um, this is a, uh, a quotation from Lakshmi Tantra, 28, uh, chapter 28, verse 14, the goddess whose form is compassion. Her form, her very form is compassion, right? We have uh, goddesses of compassion in, uh, in other religions also. In, uh, in Buddhism, in some forms of Buddhism, we have this goddess. In, uh, in, uh, in, in China, she's called uh, Kuan Yin. In, uh, in Japan, in Japanese, she's called Kanon. And she is the goddess of compassion, the goddess of compassion. So we, we have this in many, many different faiths around the world. We have uh, somebody who's, the, who's considered to be the goddess of compassion. There are equivalents. But anyway. So uh, the goddess whose form is compassion exists as if mercy itself had taken form. As if mercy itself had taken a form. She is the one who subjugates the autonomy of the independent Lord and arouses him to compassion. So he's autonomous. He's Swatantra. He's completely independent. She subjugates that. She goes to him and says, no, you have a duty towards these, these sinful living beings. You have a duty towards others and you should save them. And arouses his compassion, right? It's not that the Lord doesn't have compassion. He also has compassion. But in order to show his independence, his, his compassion has to be aroused. How is his compassion aroused? It can be aroused in different ways, but the, the 100% uh, successful way to arouse his compassion is by using a mediator and using the perfect mediator, Mahalakshmi, Sri Devi. That's the 100% way of arousing his compassion. So if you want to arouse his compassion, you might try different methods, but this is the best method. So the crow, Kakasura, had committed a heinous crime and was about to be beheaded by a brahmastra. A brahmastra is a, a, a weapon, a sort of mantra weapon uh, that Lord Rama knew how to wield. So he was going to behead this crow for pecking at Sita. But Sita, the goddess, was present, and so his neck was saved, right? Otherwise, his neck would have been cut off by the brahmastra, right? When she took pity on him, she took pity on this crow, right? Thus, he was protected by her mercy. And this, uh, this quotation, protected by her mercy, comes from uh, Ramayana uh, 536.29, where it says, by expressing pity for the crow, Kakashura, who had attacked her breast, Sita prevented it from being killed by Rama. Right. So Ravana, however, was, was in a similar state, helplessly trapped, right? He had made this mistake of kidnapping Sita, and therefore he was bound to be uh, taken to task by Lord Rama. So, but because she was not present, she was not present when the Lord fought with Ravana, even though he had not inflicted any physical harm to Sita. Right? She was being kept, but she was, you know, she was kept a prisoner. You know, she wasn't allowed her freedom, but physically he didn't harm her. Uh, like the crow, right? He, so the crow, the crow was more offensive because the crow actually pecked it at, uh, at Sita, whereas Sita was being kept nicely in the, although in prison, of the prison in the Ashok uh, forest uh, by Ravana. She was unharmed. So even though Ravana didn't harm her, still he kidnapped her. That was an offense. And therefore he perished. Unlike the crow, he perished as, uh, as the target of Rama's arrow. Rama chanted the Aditya Hridaya Mantra on his arrow and he killed Ravana. Therefore, her presence is necessary for those resorting to the Lord. So this is a very nice example. There's probably a lot of other examples that we can, that we can make. Of course, we have to remember that, that she's, she wasn't really separated from the Lord. 
because Mahalakshmi or uh, Sri Devi is never actually separated from the Lord. But in the, in the Leela, in this world, in the play, she appears to be separated from the Lord when she is, when she is, appears to be kidnapped by Ravana. Thus, he has revealed the meaning of the word Srimat. Thus, he has revealed the meaning of the word Srimat. So this, let's see what Vidyanangacharya has to say about this uh, text 135. So again, the meaning of the sutra, because she was with Sri Rama, right, at the time of the attack of the crow, the pecking of the crow, the crow Kakasura had committed the greater sin, survived, right? The greater sin was the, the crow actually um, committed bodily harm to Sita. Because she was not with him, Ravana, who committed a lesser sin, he only just kidnapped her, put her in, in a protective custody, you know, put her in jail. Um, compared to the crow, was killed because she wasn't with Rama at the time when Rama and Ravana fought. So that her mediation is required can be seen even during his Vibhava Avatara. His Vibhava Avatara, right? Remember, there's different types of forms of the Lord. The Ram Avatara is a what we call a Vibhava Avatara. There's Karnika, Vyuha, Vibhava, Antoyana, and Archa, these five forms of the Lord, according to Pancharatra. So Vibhava is the Leela Avatar. It's called a Leela Avatar. It's a descent that the Lord takes for performing a particular pastime. That's what a Leela Avatar means. So in the descent as Lord Rama, where, where Sita accompanies him, as his divine consort, Mahalakshmi, incarnate to Sita, right? Uh, this is the story that happened, right? That, the, that the, the crow committed the greater sin, but was saved by her compassion, by, the, by her being there, and Ravana committed a lesser sin, but was killed because she wasn't, wasn't there to protect him, right? Thus far, the, but she did protect. She protected those where she was, where she was situated, after Ravana was killed, Hanuman wanted to kill all the Rakshashis, all the, the, the female Rakshashas who were guarding her in the prison, in the Ashokavana. And, and she, she, she convinced him not to, right? I think we discussed that also. That's, that's how good she is at convincing people. She convinced Hanuman, don't, uh, don't kill these, these, these uh, ladies. They don't, they don't have my guards. They don't have any fault. There's no fault, right? Let them. Let them go, have mercy upon them. So, uh, thus far, the word, the term Srimad has been explained. Right. So, the next word in the mantra, Sriman Narayana, Sriman Narayana Charano Sharan Papadye, is we're, we're talking about the first part of Gwaya Mantra. In the second part of the Gwaya Mantra, we have Srimate Narayanaya. So in both cases, the second word is Narayana and Narayanaya. So now we have to understand what is meant by the word Narayana. Right now, we've already discussed the word Narayana before when we discussed the Tira Mantra, because in Tira Mantra, Om Namo Narayanaya, the third word is Narayanaya. So we have to see here when it comes in conjunction with Sri, Srimant, and also in the context of the first part and the second part of the Dwaya Mantra, whether that adds to, right, the meanings of the word Narayana and how it adds to those. So that's the next topic.